Charles Leclerc will take a 10 place grid penalty in this weekend's Saudi Arabian Grand Prix after needing a third set of control electronics. And this is the second race of the season, just in case that slipped anyone's <laughs> mind. Uh, are we surprised? Was this expected, Lawrence? What does this mean for Ferrari as you go into the weekend? Well, we knew ahead of the Bahrain race that they'd already changed the energy store and the control electronics on the car, which is pretty unusual ahead of the first race. Um, to put it in perspective, they have two sets of control electronics uh, to get them through the entire season. So in an ideal world, you'd probably be changing them somewhere midway through the year. Um, uh, potentially, if you have a reliability upgrade, you might change that slightly. But it's one of those components that you just expect to last. And yet mm -hmm. in uh, Bahrain, they managed to get through too, because when Charles Leclerc, uh, his car retired at the side of the track, it turned out that was linked to the control electronics. And it is it is almost unbelievable because Ferrari's big focus over the winter was reliability. And uh, they had a change of management, of course. We had Fred Vasseur coming in as team principal in, instead of Mattia Bonotto. But all the time we were talking to Fred uh, at the launch of the car, um, at the test and ahead of the first race. And, you know, we're saying, are you sure the reliability is good? You know, that was a weakness. You had to turn the engine down last year. You lost performance. Is it all good this year? And he kept saying, everything we know, all the stuff we've done on the um, dyno uh, rigs back at the factory suggests it's fine. And then they have this issue, which they claim they haven't encountered at any point uh, up to now, uh, twice, essentially. Um, obviously, some fairly clear issue with, with, with the, with the uh, components. And then you have this bizarre situation where he has a grid penalty for the second race, which I, in the whole time that we've had these grid penalties for engine changes. I don't remember that ever happening. I'm pretty sure it hasn't uh, because usually these starts come in later in the year. And it also means realistically, look, you know, if he puts a new set in now, even if they run perfectly to their normal lifespan, he's probably still going to have a grid penalty somewhere down the line when he replaces it again later in the season. So yeah, a real setback and just given Ferrari's reliability issues last year, um, pretty, pretty disappointing all round and yeah, verging on unforgivable, I think. Yeah. And we were pretty stunned, weren't we, Lawrence, when, in Bahrain, you know, the morning of the race, that that news that came out saying that they changed the parts. It's just so so unusual to see. And I think for every Ferrari fan who went through a lot of pain last year, it just feels like more of the same. So pretty crazy. And um, yeah, I think there's a few stats people trying to work out if anyone has, you know, the earliest people have had engine penalties. Um, but yeah, it's 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 nuts. I can't believe that this is kind of the storyline going into the year because especially with Red Bull being so far ahead as well, mm -hmm. this just feels like an added kick to the gut, doesn't it? Um, in terms of wanting the season to be close. I feel like we sometimes laugh at the expense of Charles Leclerc's bad luck. We certainly did a season ago. And then obviously what happened in Bahrain and now this. I'll be very curious to see the sense that you get from him, Lawrence, in your conversations this weekend leading into the Grand Prix. But where do you feel like he is mentally? I mean, you try to squash what happened a season ago, all of that disappointment after so much optimism at the beginning of the season. And then you start a new fresh season, new team boss. You feel like you've worked through some of the kinks, as you mentioned. And then to have this right off the bat, a DNF, and then now a 10-place grid penalty, like I just can't imagine where he is mentally. Yeah, and especially when you see how strong Max Verstappen was in that first race, how reliably the Red Bull ran well. I mean, it was only one race, but it didn't have any issues. And then also just how dominant it looked. And, uh, you know, this was the thing going into this season was that um, Ferrari either had to well, really, they had to catch up in performance no matter what, but really they had to have the reliability there if they were going to have a sustained title challenge, which, of course, is the reason that Charles Leclerc is up Ferrari. He wants to do that with Ferrari. He's mm -hmm. made that very clear. But, yeah, to have this, you know, kick in the teeth so early on um, is is rough. Uh, I mean, if you want to try and put a positive spin on it, which maybe he'll try and do because he has no other choice, uh, you could say, well, look, get this out the way early. You know, if the performance starts to come to the car, who knows what's going to happen further down the year? It's a 23 race season. You know, Max could have problems as well. So um, I guess that's the only way you can look at it. It's, it would be very devastating if you had this kind of issue at the final two races and you lost a championship that way. But um, yeah, this is me just trying to put some kind of positive <laughs> spin on it. But I, I think really it's um, it's a really tough one for him to get his head around. But then whatever choice does he have? You know, he has to go out there and try and qualify as high as possible uh, on Saturday so that he's not starting halfway down, you know, uh, the mm -hmm. bottom 10 of the grid because uh, it's, it's most likely a 10-place grid penalty. Could be, well, could, could be back of the grid if they decide to change yeah. the power unit as well. I thought it was interesting. The Italian press had reported that 
LeClaire requested a meeting with Ferrari president John Elkin uh, to discuss kind of the situation that's ongoing. And you guys know, obviously, better than I. Is it normal protocol? Does it happen often that a driver would go over the head of their team boss and meet with the president to have these kind of discussions? Because I think a lot of people are questioning what is Charles Leclerc's future at Ferrari, given obviously the blunders that we've seen time and time again. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty rare, isn't it, um, for a lot of the teams? Um, and if you actually look at the structure, I mean, it was interesting. We had a uh, had a media breakfast with uh, Gunther Steiner and a few other journalists mm-hmm. um, in Bahrain, and we were talking about the difference of his job compared to, say, Fred Vasseur at Ferrari. And he said, you know, for him, he talks to the drivers. He's the point man. He kind of runs that team because it's such a small operation. He said, if you look at what Mattia did or what Fred does now at Ferrari, there's he's part of – he's one cog in this whole machine – and a driver, I mean, you know, the drivers at Haas, just to, use, to continue that example, would obviously speak. They'd want to know what Gene Haas is thinking, but they deal with Gunther. They'd never call up Gene Haas and say, here's, you know, here's what I think. So the fact that Charles has that relationship, and I think because there's this sense that Charles Leclerc is the the prodigal son at Ferrari as well, isn't there? So I think that Ferrari want to keep him happy at every given juncture. Um, but yeah, if you're Mercedes, you know, Lewis Hamilton deals with Toto Wolff. He doesn't go above him to Mercedes. Uh, at Red Bull, your first point of contact is Christian Horner and Helmut Marko. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously, Dietrich Mateschitz has passed away last year, but he would kind of have a very fleeting involvement in that. You wouldn't really speak to him, you know, on a on a on, on that kind of level. So, yeah, it's completely completely unique, and um, I think the Italian press love that as well. When I remember when when Alonso was at Ferrari, and you know, when he used to talk to Luca di Montezemolo, it would be the big the big story heading into every race was kind of you know Alonso's talking to the president. What could he possibly want? Uh, and I think that goes back to the Schumacher days and maybe even before when, you know, Schumacher was just such a big personality. He would, you know, he wanted to talk to the, the top guy in the company, you know, when he was dealing with stuff. So, um, yeah, always, always gains headlines. I'm not sure how concerned Ferrari should be about that because, you know, as we might discuss, there's not a huge amount of places that, that Charles can actually go, I don't think. Okay, to that point, you know, there's obviously always going to be rumors and speculation. We had this conversation last week with Lando Norris. If McLaren's not going to be in a position to give him the car that he needs to compete and win races, you know, how long does that relationship last? If we continue on this way, and even if Fred Visser makes changes, which it seems like he has the green light to be able to do at Ferrari, you know, if Charles Leclerc doesn't feel like there's a future here that results in championships, where would we see Charles Leclerc maybe in the future, Lawrence? Yeah, that that's a big question because if you look around, you look at Red Bull, which is obviously the team that everyone wants to be at right now because they have the fastest car. Max Verstappen is tied in there for what seems like a lifetime, right? You know, he's um, <laughs> he, he he's there uh, till at least twenty seven. He seems very very willing to stay there. Um, they're going to have a competitive car until the next change in uh, engine regulations around twenty twenty six, you'd think. Um, so why would Red Bull upset that by bringing Leclerc into into Verstappen's team? Um, then Mercedes, well, Mercedes actually aren't in much of a better position than Ferrari right now. Um, you know, they, their race in Bahrain was pretty terrible. They, they're talking about um, a completely new car concept going forward, at least Ferrari aren't at that stage. And then if you want to put a positive spin on, on Leclerc's position going forward is that, you know, he's a very central part to to that team. I don't think anyone's pointing the finger and saying the drivers are the issue. And um, he also with Vasseur in place now and uh, Benedetto Vigna, who's above Vasseur, wanting to make changes uh, w- within the team, already making changes within the team. Uh, there's talk of uh, people leaving from the uh, design department. Now, okay, that, that could speak to uh, a lot of the, the deeper issues there, but it could also be the case that it is time to have a change and and, and to bring in uh, new people. So um, I guess that's the way he's got to look at it. But as always in F1, there's, it's very rare that there's a short-term fix. And with this weird kind of, driver market we have at the moment where so many drivers are on long-term contracts it's really hard to just jump around and, and find a competitive car um i mean fernando alonso will tell you that you know he, he <laughs> go at it he's like 2006 onwards and yeah. never quite got a championship after then so um yeah it's not it's not as easy as just being one of the best drivers on the grid and saying right i need a better car because you've got to find a way into a better car and it's not always straightforward Thanks so much for watching ESPN on YouTube. And for more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for premium content and live streaming, subscribe to ESPN+.